Hello, welcome to this special presentation from the Mashpee Enterprise and Mashpee TV. I am Mashpee Enterprise reporter Ryan Spencer. Our program today is titled Our Backyard Bats. Meet the scientist who studied echolocation in Mashpee. Unbeknownst to most, Mashpee played an important role in the discovery and study of echolocation in bats. Donald Griffin, the scientist who coined the term echolocation in 1944 after discovering the phenomenon in bats, studied bats in Mashpee over a period of almost 70 years, starting in the 1930s. Today we have James Simmons, a leading bat researcher and professor at, of biology at Brown University, here to tell us a little bit more about bats in our own backyard. Thanks for joining me today, Professor Simmons. Thanks. You studied bats in Mashpee for a number of years alongside Professor Griffin uh, before he died in 2003. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, those early studies of bats uh, in the old Indian meeting house in Mashpee and uh, how these studies led to the discovery of echolocation? Okay, well, the meeting house here in Mashpee has always had a big colony of bats in it. Uh, most of them are little brown bats, and they live in the meeting house in the roof, the attic spaces, and the eaves during the summer. And then in the winter, they migrate up into the mountains in New Hampshire and Vermont to hibernate because the temperature the bats need for hibernation is going to be above freezing a little bit. And the, the roof spaces in the meeting house will go well below freezing on a typical Cape Cod winter day or night. So they, they migrate. And, um, Don Griffin's first work with these animals was to find out where they went. So he banded the animals and then, track, and then tracked them to places in New Hampshire and Vermont where the bats wound up going for the winter. And it's kind of surprising that an animal this is very small, weighs maybe 10 grams, will fly all the way up to Vermont to spend the winter and then come back down to Mashpee for the summer to sit around and eat insects by Trout Pond and in this area. Um, the echolocation was discovered um, during the very end of World War II, and its relationship to radar was very quickly uh, understood and appreciated. And a lot of early work on, on bats and echolocation had to do with, do bats use principles similar to the way we use for radar or in water for sonar? Uh, and after a while, watching the bats, and Griffin and, and other people studying, they realized they're better. They, these animals live in a world of sonar, uh, and the, the whole the surround around them is seen from echoes. We see things with our eyes, with vision and so forth, and we're used to thinking that way about things. Bats see things from echoes of sound, and it's a completely different world. But it's a workable one because bats have been around for 65 million years and some of the earliest fossil bats over that time are similar to modern bats in many ways. So it's a very successful operation. And these bats here in Mashpee played an important role because understanding how bats use their sonar, for example, when a bat flies along and detects an insect with its sonar, how it goes through an interception maneuver mm -hmm. to catch the insect, teaches you a lot about how their echolocation system works and how their hearing operates as kind of the pilot inside the bat's head to operate the system. Yeah, and when did you start studying bats here in Mashpee? I began studying bats here in Mashpee, I would guess it was about 20 years ago. Uh, Don Griffin had been tired at that point, and he would come down here working with Greg Auger to study the bats on the pond. Greg had developed a technique for illuminating bats. You can't see them, of course, in mm -hmm. the dark. And if you have a camera that's sensitive to bright light, normal light, you turn the light on, the bats disappear. They don't like it. But if you use an infrared camera and you illuminate the scene with infrared light, you can see the bats. The problem is you're also illuminating the trees behind the bat, and so you can't see them very well. And Greg's solution was to illuminate the scene with infrared light but from the sides mm. so that the bats and the insects are easily seen, but the background is relatively dark. And with that technique, we spent a lot of time making recordings of bats doing interception maneuvers and flying around. They chase each other. Bats have dar dog fights in the, in oh, the wow. dark. Now, there's a problem. How do you have two animals, using both using sonar, conduct dog flights with each other? Then how, how would you do this? <laughs> it's not easy to imagine. They yeah. regard it as easy. Yeah, uh, so you were down in the Mashpee River woodlands adjacent to Trout Pond. Uh, right. Can you kind of set the scene? What kind of equipment were you using and uh, what, what year was it about? 
Okay, well, this would be in the range of about 2010, maybe. Um, the equipment in those, those days, which is recent by research on bats, the mm -hmm. earliest work involved bringing recorders the size of, of, uh, of refrigerators mm -hmm. with tape reels this big around. Um, the equipment was small by the early day standard, but still involved having several pelican cases with mm -hmm. cameras and recorders and tripods and, and batteries to operate the equipment. You would go to this place, set it up so that the camera would be looking in one direction, the illumination system from another direction, and a third type of camera uh, set up using temperature. You can watch bats not only by illuminating from infrared, but videoing them from their own body heat so that you don't have to illuminate. And we use the combination of these infrared illuminating and these thermal imaging video cameras mm. to study the bats. And you'd put ultrasonic microphones, attach them to the branches around where the bats are flying so you can record their sounds and synchronize the sounds with the maneuvers. Now these sounds, these are sounds that normal humans cannot hear, is that That's correct? That's right, even, even abnormal humans can't really hear them. Um, the, the little brown bats, the lowest frequency they might make is around 35,000 cycles per second, mm -hmm. 35 kilohertz. And that's completely inaudible to a human. The big brown bats, they might go down to 15,000 mm. uh, cycles per second. Uh, and when I was a student, I could hear that ticking sound in the background. The bats would go flying by and you like that. Mm. But I can't hear that now at all. So it's on uh, the edge of the spectrum of human so it's hearing. It's right at the edge of human hearing. That's called ultrasonic. Mm. It's higher in, uh, in audio. Um, so we have devices, a bat detector, for example, mm -hmm. with a microphone that picks up the bat sounds and translates them down to lower frequencies so we can hear them. Oh, wow. Um, and we have a couple videos, actually, that we'd like to show of these bats at mm -hmm, Trap Pond. Mm -hmm. uh, in this first video, a fly is used as bait to attract mm -hmm. the bats. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we'll show that video now. Well, as you saw, the bat found this, this is a, it's a fly fishing fly hanging without a hook on a string. And as you saw, the bat finds it with its sonar and then flies over and makes repeated attempts to catch it, to pull it off of its little thread, but it couldn't pull it off. The very fact that it can see something that small mm -hmm. using just its sonar is remarkable. And what did you learn about bat behavior watching these bats uh, feed on the bugs around Trout Pond? Well, there's two things. The, one of them is, that, of course, they can see the bugs. And the other thing is that there's more than one bug, mm -hmm. then they can see the individual bugs well enough to home in on one and catch it. So they'll see a cluster of things mm -hmm. where it's not like a blob. There's a, it's, it's pieces of it that they can see separately. Mm -hmm. And be, imagine being able to use sonar to fly into a cloud of insects and catch one insect, even though you have echoes from all of the others at the same time. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. Uh, this second video, too, is quite remarkable. Uh, uh, this is in the glade across from Trout Pond, uh, where it's dense and wooded. Uh, and it's a swarm of bats, actually, all moving uh, in close proximity to each other, but never hitting each other. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about how this works and how they're all able to hunt in such tight quarters? That's a good question. I wish we knew the answer. <laughs> if you watch three or four bats flying in a small space with insects, the first thing you get impressed, just ignore the insects for a minute. If there's multiple bats there, they're moving around in such a way that it gives you the impression they're attached to each other with little mm. elastic bands. So the bats are moving, not in organized parallel way. They're moving, but in a relationship to each other that's more complicated than just going in parallel. They're moving as a group, but independently with the knowledge of where each other others are. And every once in a while you'll see one bat chase another, mm -hmm. where one bat is flying along, another bat will come over and bump it out of its flight path while they're in the same area chasing insects. And then if you see a bat home in on an insect, it'll fly up to the insect and catch it. When they get into a very close to a capture, they increase the rate that their sounds come out. So you hear this like that, and that tells you that it was a capture. 
Yeah. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so all these bats are, are flying in close proximity and homing in on their prey like that. Uh, what do they do when they catch the prey? Do they stop making noises? Good question, okay. Bats that catch insects in the air, in open air, these aerial capture bats, they'll fly up to the insect, and what they'll do is they get very close and they'll scoop the insect up in the bat's tail. Mm. The bat will bring it up in the tail and put it in its mouth. And for that short period of time, they're stopping their sonar so they can eat, get the insect in the mouth. But then what they'll do, as soon as the tail is out of the way, and often when the insect is still in the, being chewed in the mouth, they'll emit another sound quickly to just be sure they're not about to crash into something. And what was it about these bats, specifically the ones in Mashpee, that made them good subjects for the studies that you were working on at Brown University? Well, they catch insects in the air, which is a difficult problem. They fly around in groups, which is difficult to understand. And they chase insects in these clusters where there's more than one insect. Mm -hmm. All of these are hard problems to imagine. Now, down here over by the Cape Cod Canal, there's an Air Force antenna, the PAVEPAWS antenna, which is an anti-ballistic missile radar system, which searches in space for individual missiles, and it can find individual missiles in a way that we would like to know how bats do that. It's a tough problem. Mm -hmm. um, other bats chase insects on the ground. The, uh, these big brown bats, which you have at Trout Pond also, not only chase insects flying around, but if beetles are landing on the vegetation, they'll go and take them off the leaves. Being able to see the bat, the bat sees the insect on the, on sitting on the leaf, so to speak. Yeah, so you, you talk about echolocation as somewhat comparable to sonar and the, the technologies that uh, the military often uses, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be in ships or planes or mm -hmm. otherwise. Uh, how can we as people who are maybe familiar with those technologies compare this with, with bats? Well, the difference, so to speak, is that, that, that military radar and sonar compared to bats is amateurs and the bats are professionals. Their whole lives and their view of the world is coming through the system. So the, the things that govern acoustics, the travel of sound through the air and reflection off of objects is, is an entirely different environment, but it works pretty well because they've been doing this. There's a human named Daniel Kish who's been blind for a long, mostly very close to birth, and he's learned to make clicks of his tongue mm. for his own echolocation system. And I was at a meeting with him a few years ago, and we were all discussing, asking him, what's it like? What, what does the world seem like to someone who can't use vision to locate objects? And the two most surprising things he said were, one is, you can be in a room with a grand piano, and you have no idea it's there, because there's higher than the grand piano, and you're making tongue clicks, the echoes bounce off the piano and go elsewhere but the echoes from the corners of the room stand out as markers for the space. Now, if we were thinking in visual terms, that wouldn't be intuitive. But of course, mm -hmm. once you think about it, well, that's right. If the sound doesn't hit the object and come back directly, then you won't know it's there. And corners are designed to be that kind of reflection from an acoustic point of view. Yeah, in the late 1930s, early 1940s, when uh, Professor Griffin started to uh, really understand and discover echolocation, how did the scientific community respond? Initially with, I would say, derision and disbelief. Um, science is filled with the uh, cases where you find something that seems so obviously impossible that the best you could do is laugh at it. One scientist once went over to Griffin at a meeting and shook him by the lapels and said to him, oh, you can't believe this, you can't say this, it will ruin your career. <laughs> Instead, it made his career. Um, just like everything in science, you find things that are un unbelieved, unbelievable. You just have to, to work at it to show people that it's true or to disprove it. And that's an important point. And as you mentioned, this is uh, World War II era. So obviously, the military was pretty interested in uh, this whole phenomenon of echolocation as they're working on sonar and other technologies mm -hmm. like that. Uh, how did that uh, play into to the whole thing? How did bats uh, become part of this uh, era of technology around mm -hmm. sound? Part of it was just realizing that bats and dolphins underwater 
do this out of an amazing professional skill. This is their life, their way of living. And it, it, it sets the proof that there are ways of using sound, bouncing off of things, to do a lot more than just, oh, here is a target, or here is an open space. It's, it's a way of seeing the world and producing in the animal's mind images of where things are and what those objects are. And all of the work that came out of the discovery of echolocation a lot of is focused on what is it that bats and dolphins actually see with their mm. sonar? And is, this, is there something we can learn, for example, about from how they do this to build better radar or sonar systems? Because there are a lot more uses for radar and sonar than just military, mm -hmm, too. For mm -hmm. example, for guidance of cars, anti-collision methods. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm curious as well, uh, just kind of uh, about bat populations in general. How are they doing in the world at this time? And uh, one of the things that a lot of folks probably have heard about is uh, white uh, ear syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. What, uh, how are bat populations doing okay. in the world well, today? A, a, a quick summary is that roughly a fifth of the mammals in the world are bats. Oh, wow. Which is a lot. There are well over a thousand species of bats, and they're found all over the world. With in the temperate zones around here, mm -hmm. you have small number of species, but very large numbers of individuals in yeah. each species. Um, the free-tailed bats in Texas, for example, you have 10,000 bats in a single, 10 million bats in a single cave. Wow. You go to the tropical parts of the world, particularly rainforest, you'll find a larger number of species, but not quite as many of any individual species. This, the diversity has become more mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. um, in, in North America, the, the little brown bats that hibernate in caves have, are very vulnerable to, to diseases that they catch in the caves. And there's a disease called white nose syndrome, yes. which is, um, it's, it's, the fungus lives in cave environments and it happens to be just about right for infecting bats when their body temperature in the cave is just above freezing. Bats that are infected with this fungus, um, they wake up periodically during the winter and use up their fat storage so that by the time they get to spring, they've used up all their mm. fat and they're dead. And this has decimated little brown bats populations all over North America, starting in, in northern New England when it was first noticed, upper New York State, mm -hmm. spreading towards the west. Um, in Europe and Eurasia, on the Eurasian continent, the fungus is there, but it's, a, it, it's, it's been there a long time, and the bats are, have, have developed some kind of immunity to it. And I would expect that populations will recover here eventually as the bats develop immunity, but the damage is severe. Mm -hmm. For example, in large parts of Atlantic Canada, bats have been nearly extirpated by this disease. And we still don't know much about the dynamics of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I accidentally uh, called it white ear disease, but That's it's white right. nose disease. Like, yeah. uh, just make sure that I got that correct. Um, and uh, so these these uh, these bats that are in mashpee, uh, what species are they, and are they impacted by uh, this disease as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, the bats, the, the meeting house bats, for example, mm -hmm. in Mashpee, the larger number of bats that we see at Trout Pond are little brown bats. Now, there are two or three different species of that group of bats. They're called myotis, is the genus, which essentially means mm -hmm. mouse, mouse-eared. Um, the... Um, <clears throat> They're very vulnerable because although they're here in the summer in Mashpee, they go north to caves in the New England to hibernate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's where they get exposed to the disease and die. Mm. The other bat that's most common here is the big brown bat. And its name in Latin, Eptesicus fuscus, is brown house flyer. They live in houses. And because they hibernate in houses, they're not going to the caves and becoming exposed. So the, the, the population of bats here is shifting in favor of the big brown bats compared to the little brown bats mm. until the dynamics of this population effect work their way out. Yeah, you, these little brown bats, are they, uh, what is their cur current status? Are they listed as endangered or are they otherwise protected? Well, several, several of the species in the group, the big brown, the little brown bats, the myotis group, uh, in Indiana and in, in, in the Ozarks, for example, the gray bats and the Indiana bat, they were already endangered because they're, they're relatively numerous, but all of them live in eight caves. And so they're very vulnerable to the damage to a single mm -hmm. cave population. Whereas the other little brown bats are much more widely spread and they're not vulnerable to damage to any single roost. 
Mm -hmm. But the white nose disease has really affected them. In some areas, the populations are very down. And until, until we get a better understanding of how the dynamics of this will play out on populations of bats, it's best to treat them as very much endangered. Yeah, and uh, is there anything about the, the trout pond area that uh, was especially kind of uh, good habitat for these bats or good hunting grounds for these bats? They seem to have returned here for years and years. Well, they, they like it, obviously. There are a lot of bugs. And the whole point of being a bat coming around, at least in this part of the world, is finding bugs to eat. There are, there are moths and beetles and flies. The big brown bats tend to eat larger beetles and moths. Both groups, by the way, the, the beetles and the moths have evolved the ability to hear the sonar sounds of bats and take evasive action. Mm. So you, if you were go to a street light in the summer, where you see moths flying around at night, and take keys out and jangling the keys, those moths will run away because they think that's a bat coming. And they, they've evolved a way of coping with that. The little brown bats tend to eat smaller insects, and that's important because at the bottom end of the size range they like are mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And mosquitoes are not a good thing to have around because of the disease they carry. It's a fact that shocked me when I discovered it. Malaria was eradicated in New Jersey in 1956. That's a long time not a long time ago. Um, th these animals are very important for the control of those kinds of insects here. Mm. In the southwest, Texas, for example, and Oklahoma, the free-tailed bats are crucial for eating a lot of the pests on cotton and corn. And they, they, they're worth, literally worth a fortune in terms of replacements for insecticides mm -hmm. because they eat tons of insects every night. So uh, whereas many people kind of associate bats with vampires or bad things, what you're telling me is that these are actually very beneficial species that are uh, kind of good friends to human beings. Well, they are friends. It's important. Um, um, bats have a bad rap in Western civilization, partly because of the vampire legends and Dracula. There's some really wonderful video clips of, of Bela Lugosi playing Dracula, listening to the bats outside and the animals saying, ah, the children of the night, what music they make, that kind of thing. Um, but bats are very important. They have this negative rap in, in European culture, but for example, in, in the Mayan language, two of the alphabet symbols are bats. And in lots of different parts of the world, the Chinese use the word, the word for bad is the same as word for good fortune or good luck. Mm. They, they, they see bats in a more positive light, um, partly because they're more, more often exposed to them. Uh, if you go into a building or a temple in India, for example, you nearly always see bats festooned around on the walls and in the ceiling. That's part of, of the world they live in, and the people are more used to it. Now, kind of talking about the mythology and the common perceptions around bats, one of the phrases that we hear a lot are, is blind as a bat. Is that, a, in fact, a thing? Are bats blind in terms of their sight, at least? A lot of bats. Most bats that chase insects around, their vision is rather poor. Mm -hmm. They don't have the ability to see shapes in detail compared to the way their sonar works. Mm -hmm. But they do use the light a lot. Uh, for example, when a bat comes out of a cave, it checks to see that the light level outside the cave is, is dark enough to come out. And if not, the bats will often fly in a little spiral just inside the cave entrance. And then when it gets dark enough, they'll peel off and go out. They use it, of course, to set their biological clocks for the sunrise and sunset. They probably use it for orientation. If you take bats, for example, from Mashpee and truck them 25 miles away and turn them loose, a good many of them will simply come back to Mashpee. They can't use sonar for that because their sonar only works over distances of a few tens of feet, maybe 100 feet at the most for really big objects. So they have alternative, they have a whole system for navigating lightly based on celestial cues or magnetic cues, which let them find their way over much longer distances. All right, so you're out there in the Mashpee River woodlands uh, right next to Trout Pond. You have your camera set up and you're listening to these bats on a bat detector. Mm -hmm. What do you hear when you're out there? Okay, what, what we hear, if there's a bat flying around, one bat, for example, the bat, the bat sounds are very short and when they come out of the bat detector, they sound like 
little clicks. To the bat, they're chirps. They go mm -hmm. chirp, chirp, chirp. But we hear <coughs> So what you would hear is <coughs> And then when they detect an insect, they go <coughs> catch the insect and then go back <coughs> like that. Now, mash pea bats, as all of the bats here, are working above the range of human hearing. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the desert southwest or desert areas in many parts of the world, there are bats that are larger, and some of them operate down as low as 5 or 10 kilohertz. And if you're out in the desert and you're listening at night, you're going to hear ting, ting, ting. That's the bat sounds. They have much lower frequencies and much longer operating ranges. So they'll fly higher. They're often looking for bigger insects. But they're there. Yeah, so you've worked with bats all over the world, uh, as well as here in Mashpee. I'm curious uh, about the, the, la the, the bats that you work with in your, your lab. I've heard mm -hmm. that you have uh, names for them. Right, OK. We, have, we study big brown bats. Mm -hmm. We catch them from a barn in Rhode Island. Um, barn, Rhode Island, believe it or not, has most of it is empty rural areas and their barns and the bats in them. And we name them. When we bring the bats into the lab, we, we give them names. Um, you're supposed to, I suppose, <laughs> give them letters like the bat XD47Y, but that's not the way you think about things. You, we have a bat named Arya, a name from the Game of Thrones. A lot For a while, all of the students in the lab wanted to name the characters of the bats from the characters in Game of Thrones. So we had a bunch of them, Denny's, Arya, and so forth, Jon Snow. Uh, we have a bat named Heisenberg, who <laughs> was named from the, the mythical name of the character in Breaking Bad. Um, at the moment, we have a bat, we have a Henry, we have an Exy, we have uh, a bunch of other names. We use the names partly because bats have different personalities. And if, you'd have, if you have a bat that's excitable, you know it's excitable. You go into the room where the bat is and it starts making shrieking sounds. We had a bat named Ramses. No matter what you did, if there's anyone around, he's shrieking it loud, very loud. You take him out of the cage, wearing gloves of course, and you, you take him to the room where you fly them in a place where there are obstacles to see how good they are at navigating. So they'll be screeching and then going, and then you turn him loose, he's silent because the sonar sounds you can't hear. And as soon as he lands, he starts screeching again. Um, that was Ramses, a very excitable bat. We have other bats that are much more amenable to being handled. They don't fuss at all. Um, they differ in their personalities. They differ in the way they get used to people. If you have an experiment with the bats where you're flying them, and you take the bat out and you turn the bat loose and it flies around, then it lands and you do it again. Well, if you're left-handed or right-handed, the bats get disturbed. If they're used to being flown by a left-handed person and a right-handed person takes over that day, we don't do that because we discovered the bat detects that, the fact that it's the wrong person, and their behavior has changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the things that uh, is really interesting to me about bats uh, is that they are, in fact, mammals uh, just like us. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've also talked a little bit about how dolphins uh, and some sea mammals uh, mm -hmm. use echolocation. Uh, I know that dolphins are incredibly intelligent creatures. Are, are bats at all similar? Are they smart creatures? Well, one thing, the main thing about a bat is it's really tiny, and a dolphin is really big. Yes. Um, most of the life of bats is revolved around this operating in the dark, mm -hmm. and they go back and they pretty much sleep all day, and then they go out at night. It's a simpler situation from the point of view of, um, of life, but it still requires intelligence. Mm -hmm. and, and bats are smart, and they know what's going on around them, and they have a whole family of behaviors that, for example, that don't have much to do with echolocation, social communication. Um, vampire bats, when a baby vampire bat is born, it takes a whole year for that baby to be weaned from the mother because it has to learn about the social life of a group of vampires. Very much more complicated than you would think. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Dolphins are vastly more complicated. Uh, their, their social lives are elaborate, mm -hmm. um, but in a lot of ways their behavior is similar to bats. Um, the most extreme case is probably the sperm whale, which is an enormous animal. And it does all its hunting for squid at huge depths. They're down maybe half a kilometer in the ocean where it's completely dark. And yet when the whale goes down there, it's going <coughs> catches a squid. Uh, this was done by attaching recording devices and video cameras with suction cups to the back of the whale and then videoing what it would have looked like if you were down there with the whale, which of course you can. 
And the dirty little secret about a lot of, as of aspects of life for marine mammals is just like in the air for bats, half of the time it's night. And when you're in the ocean, even if you're near the surface at night, you can't see anything. There's no light to see with. Dolphins can catch fish in the surf zone where the water is breaking and there are bubbles and a lot of turbulence in a situation where the idea of using sonar would seem to be impossible. And yet they find this easy. Hmm. Now, bats are the only mammal, uh, to my understanding, that are able to fully fly. Mm -hmm. Essentially so. They've, they've evolved. The, the, word, the Latin word for the group is called chiroptera, which means wing hand. Mm -hmm. The wings have been, our hands that are modified where the fingers are the struts that support the wing membrane and the tail. Um, <clears throat> they're the only ones with powered flight, just like birds. Mm -hmm. And because they have sonar, and unlike birds for the most part, they can operate in the dark. And so being able to move around freely from flight and being able to see things in the dark, they have control of a niche of life that there's no competition from. Mm. And all of these night flying insects, it's just like it's like a gigantic gold mine for them. And they really exploited it. Yeah, um, I'm curious uh, about how they kind of compare to birds. You mentioned that birds uh, are flying creatures as well. Are they... How, how does their flight patterns kind of shape up against birds? Okay. Well, birds use vision for orientation. Now, there are a couple of different kinds of birds that live in caves, and they've evolved the ability mm -hmm. to make clicking sounds. Mm -hmm. But that's not with the precision you need for finding insects. Um, birds use vision. And when you watch a bird fly, one of the things you notice is that they almost always have the wings symmetric like mm -hmm. this. They're flying along or gliding or something. When you watch a bat flying, you'll very often see the bat pull one wing in and move with the other to make a rapid turn, for example. They have a greater fluidity for the use of these sensory motor responses of sensing something to making changes in maneuvering. One of the experiments we do, we fly the bats in a room that has rows of plastic chains hanging from the ceiling. And when they get to a particular point in the row, there's a choice place whether you go straight or left or right. And only one of those three passageways is actually open. So you have a space which is about one square foot like that. And the bat will fly into that space and turn and go out like that. And all you get is a single video frame as to what might have happened. They're very agile, and part of it has to do with the fact that they can maneuver the two wings independent of left and right of each other. Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you just have any kind of favorite facts about bats. You've been studying them all these years. Favorite facts? Yeah. Well, they're great. <laughs> they can see in the dark, and they can fly, and they run the show at night. Um, tequila comes from a plant that's pollinated by bats. Mangoes, a lot of important tropical fruit mm. foods are from plants that bats wind up pollinating. So that's important. Yeah. Uh, mangoes may not be so important on Cape Cod, but mangoes are very important in other parts of the world. And to say nothing about the importance of, of tequila, for example. <laughs> um, and then uh, finally, what is left to kind of be discovered about bats? It sounds like there's so much. What are your current studies uh, and what are other bat researchers looking into uh, nowadays? There's lots and lots of questions. Mm -hmm. um, since Griffin made the discovery of echolocation, at that time there was research being done on bats, but only a few people in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, now when we have a bat meeting, we had a bat, the first time we had a North American bat conference, it must have been a couple of dozen of us that we could all fit around a long table in a Mexican restaurant in Tucson. But now these meetings have hundreds of people or students all over the places. And there are questions that range from does, how does their sonar work? What do they eat? Where do they migrate? Uh, what do they do for mating and talking to each other? Bats are, for example, in the western part of the United States, there are lots of abandoned mines. Mm -hmm. You don't have them around here so much, but out there are a lot of abandoned mines. They're very dangerous because kids go and fall in them and get killed. So you'd want to put a grating or something over the entrance to the mine to keep people out, but you have to let the bats go in because they're using them as roosts. And this is endless, people studying all of these mm -hmm. kinds of things. What is the role of bats in the distribution, for example, of the COVID virus in China? Mm. How does that work? 
Uh, there are a number of other viruses that bats spread, but bats don't seem to get sick from them. They live in, in colonies of hundreds of thousands of individuals to millions of individuals. And when one bat gets a virus, it doesn't simply infect all the others. They've obviously evolved um, an immunity to these things, and we'd like very much to know how that works. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Simmons. It was uh, great talking with it you. It was my pleasure. This was very nice. Thank yes. you. Thank you.